This is WXOJLP Northampton, 103.3 FM, your Valley Free Radio Station. Welcome. I'm Warren Odeschulet, and this is A Baha'i Perspective. A Baha'i Perspective is a radio program that presents a Baha'i perspective on life through interviews. If you want information specifically on the Baha'i faith, you're welcome to visit the website www.baha'i.org, that's B-A-H-A-I dot O-R-G, or you can call the toll-free number 1-800-22-UNITE. Today I'm playing an interview with Francis Cognati. Here is a story of the good little Catholic girl that asked too many questions, so she turned to social activism and then became a political radical before eventually becoming a Baha'i. As a Baha'i, her horizons broadened and she felt a calling to go to Africa. I started the interview by asking Frances to describe where she grew up. I was born in Springfield, Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. I left right after I was born and lived in... Freeport, Pennsylvania. How old were you? Until I was four, and then we moved back to Springfield. So you were just a newborn when you moved to Freeport? Yes. Actually, Butler Junction, which was just outside of Freeport. Mm -hmm. And it was a mining town where my father's father and family owned the Italian bakery and worked in it, and it was a family business. So how long had your family been in Springfield before my mother's family okay was in Springfield and then and they came from Italy when my mother was 16 so that was 1926 mm-hmm. and then my mother and father got married mm-hmm. they were from the same village in Italy that so the fathers knew each other and they would go back and forth to Pennsylvania Springfield and so they kind of knew each other as young adults and finally got permission to get married mm-hmm from their fathers when they were in their 30s. Okay. All right. So So they had you and then they now why is it that they moved from Springfield to Freeport? Well, my father wanted to be with his family and keep uh, working in the family bakery mm-hmm. and that was in Butler Junction. Oh, okay, Butler Junction. Yeah. You were there for 4 years and then what your mom got homesick? Yes. Yeah. And so they moved back to Springfield, and my brother was born in Springfield. Then we grew up from then on. What part of Springfield? Springfield. Um, Let's see. For a few years from the time we moved back, we lived on Taylor Street, Mm -hmm. which was right across from the railroad tracks off of Armory Street. Mm -hmm. Very Italian neighborhood. And then my parents bought a house from an Italian family on what was called Hungry Hill off of Liberty Street, and we lived on Phoenix Street. And we didn't know this until we moved up there, but we were the only Italian family in an all-Irish neighborhood. (laughs) And back then, that was a big deal. I see. We were not well-received. Oh, really? No, because my grandfather moved in with us, my mother's father and then my mother's aunt, and they spoke Italian at home a lot. So they knew you weren't Irish? Yeah, they knew we weren't Irish, and they didn't like us because, you know, my folks were kind of loud, and there was a big garden in the backyard. And, you know, they made it like the old yeah. country. And, so they just weren't uh, friendly? or Yeah, they, they, were not, they weren't just not friendly. They were hostile. Oh, really? <laughs> yes. We, did, we were poor. We didn't have a car. So we would walk to the Irish Catholic Church, and people would all turn around and watch us come in because they wanted to know why we weren't at the Italian church, which was down in the South End. But on Sundays, the buses didn't run very well, and we could walk to the neighborhood church in a few minutes. And so we, my mother said she didn't care. We are going to go there anyway. <laughs> so we did. <laughs> but I grew up understanding a lot about prejudice. Mm, yeah. And um, it's hard to believe nowadays, but when I was getting to know the neighbor, young, uh, you know, girl, it was a girl my exact age. We were born two weeks apart. Mm. 
And so we would play together and we just really became good friends. But I suddenly realized that she was never inviting me into her house. And one day she said, you want to come into my house? I said, yeah. And so we, she snuck me in, you know, really like looking around. And you know, we were only about five and a half, six years old. And uh, I thought that was very strange because everything was so open in my house. Mm. And then her mother came into the kitchen and she said, we got to go, we got to go. But her mother saw us and her mother said, I told you never to bring that girl in this house. Oh, my God. Did you stare? We're going to have to sterilize everything. Oh, my God. Did she drink out of a glass? Did she touch anything? So, boy, I went running home, and I was all upset. I said, Ma, why are they talking like this? They're my mother, of course, you know. They're crazy. Don't pay any attention to them. But it bothered me. And then my friend couldn't come into our house because I would invite her to come play with me, and my mother won't let me. And so we played outside whenever we could, even in the cold weather. But finally, as we got a little older, because I lived in that home with my parents till I was 18, and we went to the same same school in high school, not in uh, in um, elementary school. But um, finally, she did come into our house, but I could never go into her house. Mm. Never. And years later, um, when I was home visiting from our time in Africa, and I my mother was quite. Both our mothers were very elderly. Her father had passed away. And I was visiting my parents, who no longer lived in that house, but still in the same neighborhood. Okay. Um, my friend, my Irish friend, called and said, my mother is inviting you and your mother over for coffee. We thought, oh, my goodness, it's impossible. I said, are you sure? She said, yes, I'm positive. So we went over, and she opened the fancy living room, the front door, which is the living room for special guests. And we were like, this is a miracle, it's truly a miracle. And uh, so she invited us in, and she said she was sorry for all those years. Really? Yeah. Wow. But she wanted us to be in her living room and to be a, to be friends and to resolve this before she died. And so, Isn't fortunately, my mother accepted. My mother wasn't feeling like accepting, but sure. she did. Isn't that sweet? What happened after high school? I w- had gone to public school all my life, and then. I really did not like the big public schools, so I asked my parents, could I go to a small Catholic high school? And you had to pay to go to private schools, and they were like, no way, we don't have any money. So I called the priest, the head of the school there, and uh, he said, you have to call your parish. So I called the Italian church, because we always maintain membership in that church. And I said, you know, I wanted to go there where there's scholarships. And they decided to give me a full scholarship. Mm. So I went to the small Catholic school with Sisters of Notre Dame. And it was wonderful. They were absolutely fantastic people. And I, I learned a lot. But I got very, very interested in the prophecies in the Bible. And they couldn't understand that because Catholics usually don't read the Bible in the same way that Protestants do. How is it that that happened, that you got interested in the prophecies? Was that a curiosity you had ever since you were young? or when did well, the, how, did that to, just, how did that appear? Yeah, my mother got me a little Bible when I was young. That It was like a Catholic missal, but it was all parts from the Bible from the New Testament. And I would read the stories of the apostles. And I'll never forget, you know, I would dream about the stories like they were real. You know, seeing them walking in the Holy Land and... I don't know. I just felt like it was a real thing for me. And one time, we, <laughs> my mother let me have a pajama party, and we were all doing our hair and staying up late and talking and all that. And I suddenly realized there were 12 of us. <laughs> so I called everybody <laughs> together, and I said, you know, there's 12 of us, just like 12 apostles. And they were like, oh, you're crazy. We're all girls. Why are you saying that? <laughs> And and I really, mm. in my little mind, sure. you know, at, sure. at like 12 years old, because I was about 12 then, mm. um, I said, I think Mary Magdalene was an apostle, so at least it was one woman, you know. And they just thought I was crazy, but I really mm. felt it. I felt like there was still the spirit of the apostles were on earth. Mm-hmm. And then in 1963, when I was a junior in high school, uh, Pope John the Twenty Third wrote an encyclical a letter, you know, a special letter to the Catholic 
world, to the peoples of the world. Mm. And it was so astounding. I mean, it was like, are you kidding? This is a pope writing this letter? And it was, it just changed my life. And it actually had an effect on a lot of young people. We started working on what we called social action, going out to peoples. And, and I was forbidden to go into the Puerto Rican neighborhood, which was in the north end of Springfield, because, mm. my, you know, our parents said they were all knifing each other and it was too dangerous and all this. But the, the, the school I went to was very near the Puerto Rican neighborhood. Mm. And so we took on this social action to go into the poor areas, mainly Puerto Rican, Spanish-speaking, and help the children by tutoring them and learning a little Spanish and whatever we could do. Mm -hmm. And I really felt it was this letter, this encyclical of Pope John the Twenty Third. And when I was a senior the next year, um, I was trying to decide whether to go into the convent or not. Sure. And um, I talked a lot to one of the, the nun we had for religion class, and I started asking her all these questions about this letter and about the fulfillment of the return of Christ. And mm. she said, you're always asking these questions. Mm. She said, you know, you're just the kind of person who has to search and find your, your own mm. truth. Mm -hmm. And don't stop until you do. Yeah. And I thought, wow, this is really interesting. So I did enter the novitiate. And that was in Fairfield, Connecticut. Mm. But I didn't stay very long. <laughs> Actually, I stayed very short time. Yeah. Only one day. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> yeah, they took us on a tour of the university. We were going to be going to the university as teachers. We were, we were going to be staying to be teachers. Mm -hmm. And I met a boy I knew from <laughs> from. Springfield. He was a student there, and I'm like, oh, my God, how are you? And he said, how are you going to be a nun? And I said, it's true. I'll see you every day. <laughs> <laughs> and I realized, yeah. I guess I'd have to dedicate my life to God, but someday I'd like to be yeah. married and not, right. not be alone in a convent. And, sure. you know, it just wasn't the life for me. Yeah. So they understood, and they said they would keep all my clothes. In those days, you had to wear those penguin uniforms, you know, and they would keep them for a year. And then if I didn't come back, they would give them to someone, you know, another nun who needed them. So mm. I said that was fine. Yeah. And then began my real quest because I went back and the civil rights movement had started and Springfield was in a big turmoil because of the transitioning of African Americans into the Italian neighborhood. <laughs> mm -hmm. And the minority population in the city really growing, and poverty was growing, and actually even people who were middle class were getting poorer. Mm. So um, I decided to leave the Catholic Church because they weren't... I went and asked the priest, what could I do? You know, I said, I, I'm not in the convent, but I want to be an active Catholic. And he said, well, you go, go ask the nuns. And I said, but I don't want to be with the nuns. You know, I want to be in, involved in the church. Mm. Well, he said, you can't be a priest, and what do you think you can do? So it was very discouraging. Oh, so you wanted to have, you wanted to work Just within the church person. structure. Yeah. Structure. Yeah, you know, like the social action kind mm -hmm. of thing we did in mm -hmm. high school. or. Mm -hmm. But the bureaucracy was really too So tight. they didn't offer any kind of outlet no, for no. I notice now action. people, you know, they have lay people reading and... They have opened up a lot more, but then it was like forbidden mm. for you to go up to the altar, and even altar boys, girls could not be altar boys. They were only boys, and adults didn't participate. You know, it was very different from now. I've been to the Catholic Church recently. Mm -hmm. So I decided to join the Civil Rights Movement and uh, moved into the south end of Springfield to work for the Office of Economic Opportunity. That's a nonprofit. Um, it was a government office that funded nonprofits. Okay. And so the nonprofit that was funded in Springfield still exists, actually, Northern Educational Services, it's okay. called now. Uh -huh. I mean, it was called the same then, NES, we called it. But back then, they had neighborhood centers for tutoring and social services for families. So children would come after school, and college students would volunteer to tutor kids on one on one, help them with their homework, and you know it was a it was a wonderful program. Mm -hmm. 
Now you said you left the Catholic Church, but you really were still a practicing Catholic while you were doing no, this. No, no. You so it really that that experience really disillusioned you. Yes, and I think I was it, that was building up anyway. It was because many of my questions weren't being answered. You know, the, the priest would say, "Oh, don't ask about the return of Christ," and I wanted to know. Mm. The Bible says Christ will return, and it gives all the indications, mm. and then revelations of Saint John. No one ever wanted to talk about that. Mm. That was forbidden. Don't talk about the meaning of revelations. And every mm. time I read it, I felt like there's deep meaning in this. Mm-hmm. Why don't we talk about it? <laughs> right. Things have to change, folks, you know, and they weren't listening. Mm-hmm. And they weren't really doing anything about the civil rights situation. And, I mean, some priests might have been, but not in my area. Mm-hmm. And I just did not want to be a part of something that was so bogged down with all this bureaucracy, plus... You know, I mean, no one's perfect, and the mm-hmm. priests put themselves up as being the perfect examples, but they weren't. Mm-hmm. They were human, and, you know, some of the things that I'd seen being close to the nuns wasn't so great. So I decided that I better be out there helping the poor and working on civil rights than, than hanging around this church situation. It wasn't, to me, real religion. I was always taught when I was growing up that religion is a way of life. It's not Mm -hmm. the church. Mm -hmm. You know, it's really how you live your life. And my father and grandfather and most of my family would say, it's not about going to church all the time. It's who you are and what you do, what you say. If you don't, if you don't do what you say, forget it. Mm -hmm. (laughs) You know, you may as well stay home and not go to church. Mm -hmm. So I guess I had a pretty um, liberal religious upbringing. But for a while there, I was, you know, very into the whole Catholic structure. Mm. But I think that it was the sincerity of wanting to, you know, serve God and help humanity. Well, so in the Civil Rights Movement, um, things, as you know, as people know, in the 1960s was, were very tense. Mm. There were a lot of demonstrations in Springfield. And... Uh, you know, I was marching in them with everyone, with anyone who had any sense, who knew anything about the civil rights movement. And uh, I just got more and more radical, more and more <laughs> angry, if you wish, mm-hmm. about the situation. And also very disgusted to see people that I knew very well, you know, of Italian and Irish origin, being very prejudiced about people of color or anyone different moving into their neighborhood or whatever. So um, I was investigated by the FBI. Oh, really? (laughs) Yes. (laughs) We've got you on file. Yes. And uh, (laughs) it just drove me more and more radical. Sure. There used to be a place up in um, the Hill McKnight area. It was like a garage. It said Avis Rent-A-Car but it really was not an Avis renter car. It was really an office of the Black Panthers. Ah, uh, okay. And a friend of mine said, you know, they really could use your help because no one would ever suspect that someone like you were, you know, was helping the movement. Sure. And so he told me that there's a password. If you knock on the door and you say this password, then you can go in and, you know, they would talk to me and see if I could do anything. Mm-hmm. So I knocked on the door, and the person who answered said, Lady, you got the wrong place. Get out of here. Get out of here now. And then I said, The password. And he said, Don't play games. Just get out of here. We don't want any white people here. And I just stood there, and I said, Why don't you want white people who can help you? I mean, you look at me, and you're chasing me away because you don't believe that I could be of any help. Therefore, anybody else who looks at me isn't going to believe that I'm helping you. (laughs) And he said, just a minute. And he went back in, you know, and took a while. I thought, oh, my God, what am I doing standing here? But I stayed. And then when he came back, he invited me in. And I walked down this long corridor, and it was all men. It was all black men. I mean, I didn't care. You know, I mean, to me, people are people. But the fact that it was men made me a little nervous. Of course. I was in my 20s then. Right. But I don't know. I have this fearless nature. I guess, thank God, I was protected, and I'm still here today to tell the story. Sure. But uh, they sat me down and said, "If you're, you know, if you're not sincere, you're going to get killed." Mm. And I said, "That's okay. 
because, you know, I'm sincere and I don't care, you know, what happens to me. This is just too awful for me to sit home and not do anything, you know. And they said, what do you want to do? I said, I don't know. What do you think I can do? I said, I can do anything. I'm, I'm single. I have no commitments to anybody. I'll move if you want me to move. I'll do something here in Springfield, whatever. Huh. So they said, well, there's a big project here in Springfield that you could help with. And I said, okay, what is it? And they said, <laughs> we, we're, we need a place to store guns that are coming. Oh, in. my God. <laughs> Oh my God! So I said I have the perfect place. <laughs> so in the middle of the night, they uh, <laughs> the guys brought in um, boxes and boxes of weapons made in China, by the way, <laughs> in 1966, and uh, put them down in the crawl space of the center where I was. <laughs> where you were working. working. <laughs> <laughs> on Main Street in Springfield, by the way. And, oh, uh, yeah, and closed them up and life went on. Mm -hmm. And then the FBI agent came to my apartment. <laughs> oh, my God. Well, they knew they were tapping my phone, so, you know, I never said anything important on the phone. Yeah. And this guy with a trench coat came to the apartment and said, are you Francis Carnati? And I said, yes, I am. And I said, who are you? And he said, FBI. I mean, I'm like, oh, wow, come on in, have a cup of coffee. <laughs> I've never met an FBI agent before. <laughs> so he was like, okay. So he came in and uh, took his coat off, and, and uh, he said, this is a warning. If we see you in any more demonstrations, if you are seen with certain people, um, you could be arrested. I said, oh, I thought we had freedom of speech in this country. I thought, you know... Okay, fine. I got the message. And boy, then I knew. I called my friends in, in the Panthers and I said, get the guns out now. So they did that night. Mm. They moved everything. And within a few days, I had visitors at the center. Oh. And they were searching. And they finally found the little hatchway that went down into this crawl space. And thank God it was empty. <laughs> oh, wow. What a story. <laughs> yeah. So then the Panthers asked if I would go to Memphis to help integrate Memphis State University. And I said I would. So, wow. Yeah. So I yeah. moved to Memphis. And my parents were like, <laughs> are you crazy? Well, I wasn't living well, at home. I was not yeah, living at you, home. Yeah, you but tell you weren't telling no, them no. what you were doing. No, I just told them that So what I was, did you tell them when you said, I'm going to Memphis? Well, I had a boyfriend. Oh, okay. And he was going to go to college down there. All right. And so I was going to follow him, you know, yeah. and see what I could find for work, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. Right. So I went there, and I, before, actually, I wanted to tell a story before I went there, during the same time that I had made the commitment to go. Um, I was sent a VISTA volunteer to come and help me with the project, and she moved into the same apartment where I was living. And I was so upset because she was deaf. She had hearing aids in both ears. And I'm like, oh, my God, in this situation, I don't need a handicapped person. <laughs> I think, you know, I was pretty, this was all new to me. I'd never mm. met a deaf person before. And I thought, well, let's see what she can do. And it ended up she was just, like, fantastic with the children, she did puppets and puppet shows, and people were coming. More and more people were coming into the center, and things were really lively. So one day I said to her, what have you got that I haven't got? And she said, I don't know, probably nothing much, but maybe it's my religion. I said, please, don't talk to me about religion. I don't want to know. So she told me she was a member of the Baha'i faith. I said, oh, I really don't want to know some weird thing. <laughs> I never heard of that. So she said, well, I have books you ever want to read anything so I didn't but one day she invited me to go to visit uh, the home of an elderly black woman and she said you know we have meetings and they're integrated and you know integrated meetings at that time in Springfield I'd never heard of it really except for the civil rights movements you know I didn't, the churches weren't integrated mm. and so she said if you want to come so I said oh, okay I'll come so I went there and uh, that was my first exposure to the Baha'i faith, which I was later to find out that it was in 1863 that Baha'u'llah, the prophet founder of the Baha'i faith, 
made his declaration to the world that he was the next manifestation of God and the return of Christ. No wonder in 1963, mm-hmm. when the Pope wrote this letter, there was such an impact on the world. And what did this letter say that really astounded you? Well, actually, I felt that after I read the Baha'i writings, the writings of Baha'u'llah in particular, the Pope should have put quotation marks because he was quoting Baha'u'llah. And it may have been that he was inspired, but the words, you know, Mm -hmm. were the same. Mm -hmm. You know, he was saying that mankind is one family, that we needed to unite, that the peoples of the world were destined to have peace, and he was getting more and more specific about the equality of men and women, things that to this day I haven't heard in the church. I mean, I'd like to, I should probably go back and take that letter out, but it was, it was very, very um, revolutionary for the Catholic Church. And uh, I can't remember some, mm. you know, more of the details at mm. this point, but mm. I know that when I started to study the Baha'i faith, I realized right away that it was the same spirit that you know came from the writings of Baha'u'llah and mm-hmm. that it was the same year was no coincidence I don't think Right. but um, I didn't accept the Baha'i faith very quickly because my life was already on a pathway that you know it couldn't, it couldn't change at that moment mm-hmm. and so um, I loved the friends there Zilpha Gray was the, the uh, mother of the household where we went and she was in her 80s already And I had never known either of my grandmothers. They both passed Mm. away before I was born. Mm. And so, and she really didn't know me, you know. We were just, she was showing me her album of when she went on pilgrimage to the Holy Land, which included the Baha'i shrines and things. And, you know, she was very sweet and all that. And then she said, how would you like to adopt me as your grandmother? Uh. And I thought, I would love that. Uh. So I visited every single week. And mostly I'd make her orange juice and sit and play checkers or chess with her. She could play chess really well. (laughs) And um, it was delightful. Uh, I just, I loved her. And I got to know her daughter while I was there, Zilpha Mapp. And uh, Zilpha was a fantastic soul, beautiful Mm -hmm. person. Mm -hmm. And so that was sort of that that other life in the background that, that, you know, still some spiritual influence in my life. But I really was very much hardened by the problems of racial prejudice. I mm. was very, very angry. Mm-hmm. So I went off to, and I didn't tell them any of the rest of my life. That mm-hmm. was all part and parcel of another part of my life. Sure. So I went off to Memphis, and uh, I, got it, what, I was told to get a job at Memphis State University, so I'd be on the inside. So they wouldn't, I was so shocked. I knew there was prejudice, but you know, I had long hair, and I wore a a bottom trap blue jeans that was my uniform and uh, black leather jacket and boots and stuff and I dressed up I put on a you know a skirt and I, I thought I looked really nice when I went to interview I'll never forget this one guy he was one of the deans and he had this big cigar he put his feet up on the desk and he said what the hell are you damn Yankee doing down here (laughs) applying for work? He said, you go back up north. Get out of here. He was yelling, you know, and cursing at me. And I'm like, okay, thank you very much for the interview. Bye. (laughs) So I thought, oh, boy, this is going to be hard. But I didn't give up. And eventually I got called for another interview. And the man was um, Dr. Donald Schwartz. He was the dean of chemistry. And he said, where are you from? And I said, Massachusetts. He said, oh, thank God, somebody from the North that can understand me and I can understand you. So he hired me immediately. Ah, really? So what a wonderful man. So I worked Mm -hmm. for him while this was all going on. Mm -hmm. And um, one day, the sit-in, there was a big sit-in that was arranged. And so I was looking out the window and he said, do you have your toothbrush? (laughs) And I said, no. He said, well, I'm not going to bail you out, so you better bring your toothbrush to work if you're interested in that. (laughs) So I said, well, you know, you never know. So he said, okay, what can I do? I had never said anything to him, but he I guess he knew because I was was very interested and excited about the civil rights movement. Mm -hmm. And I said, do you have anything that I can bring to the administration building? He said, it's closed. There's police standing out in front of it. This is, this is like a critical time. You can't go in there. They've got it all blocked off. And I said, well, maybe if the dean of chemistry had um, 
something that needed to be signed because it was a deadline, you know, maybe a grant has to... And he looked at me and he said, okay, I got it. He said, you better start typing right now because there is a grant that I need to finish and uh, you can bring that. So I finished it up within a few hours and uh, we put it in an official thing and he called over there and no one would answer the phones. I mean, because mm-hmm. the sit-in was going on right then. <laughs> so I walked out the door and went up to the administration building and the police said, lady, get out of here, get out of here. And I said, but you don't understand, this is urgent. I really have to get this. It has to be signed by the president of the university. There's a deadline. It's an NSF grant. And no, 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 get out of here. Go back, go back. Please, you know, please. My, and I knew everybody in the front lines and they're all watching me, but I didn't turn or anything, you know. Mm-hmm. So they finally let me in through the first barricade. Then I get inside to go upstairs. They wouldn't let me upstairs. But I had this thing from the dean. So they And I'm, you know, looking very harmless. Mm-hmm. I'm a secretary. So they let me go up. I finally, room after room, way hiding in some back office, not his office, was the president of the University of Memphis State. And he saw me with this thing. <laughs> he said, woman, you are crazy. Get out of here. I'm not signing anything. I said, please, you know, Dr. Schwartz needs this right now. So he signed it, and they, they pretty much escorted me quickly out of the building. The minute I got outside, I was facing everyone. And I shook my head, yes. And then I mouthed, and I put my three fingers up, third floor, right side. And they stormed as soon as I got out of the way. They stormed the administration building. And they, you know, confronted the president. They knew where he was. But they got arrested. (laughs) The buses came, (laughs) took them to prison. But I had the privilege of working with the the, um, American Civil Liberties Union to get them out. So most people were taken out. Mm. And Memphis State was integrated. Yeah, it was integrated. Right, right, Right after that. Yeah. Oh, that's they awesome. They had to. I mean, because legally, that was, was just, it was illegal to continue yeah. that. And this was in 1969. Yeah, 69. Wow. But at the same time, actually just before that, Martin Luther King was assassinated in Memphis. Mm. You were in Memphis at the time? Yeah. And the Panthers were disbanded, and the leaders were put in prison. And everything was falling apart. It was just like nothing was working and, oh, my gosh. Yeah, it was really terrible. And so many of us just didn't know what to do. I worked for the Great Boycott Movement with uh, Che Guevara. And then I just, and I met nuns, you know, at a very liberal Catholic church. And so I thought, well, gee, these people are really doing a lot for social action. So I started going to this church. And I met with a Monsignor who said every week I could come in and ask questions. So my questions were the same, you know. <laughs> when is Christ going to return? <laughs> and he said, why are you asking this? You take everything too literally. How many millions of years are you going to stand up there and say, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. When is the kingdom going to come? And you say for, you know, at the end of the Lord's Prayer, you say, you know, deliver us from evil. Well, when are all these promises going to be made? And he would talk to me, and we would go over the Bible, and it was all right. It was okay. I was kind of looking for something to hold on to. And then one day, I remembered that I had heard of this Baha'i faith. Mm. And my life was pretty upside down. There was more to it than that, but it was really miserable. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, those were wonderful people. Maybe they're really good people here, too. So I called... And the southern, the southern woman. I mean, <laughs> I had a real problem with southerners. You can imagine, <laughs> they would they would call me damn Yankee and throw things at me. And oh boy! I had a hard time, so I was very worried when she had a very heavy southern accent. Mm-hmm. And y'all come, y'all come. We're having our meet. You know, we have these firesides every Friday night. Y'all come. You got yeah. And I thought, what, what's right. a fireside? Oh, a fireside gathering. It's like a an informal meeting, and. Uh, they Baha'i still call it fireside, and um, so that that's what they called it in Memphis also. And it's just an informal get together in somebody's living room or around the kitchen table talking about the Baha'i faith or social questions. And I thought, well, she's just saying y'all come, but she doesn't really mean it. Anyway, so I went, 
<laughs> and they were so welcoming. Oh, that's they welcomed sweet. me in, and there were it was interracial, age all ages from elders to young people. I was so impressed at a truly southern home. These people had you know they were so open. So I was listening, you know, and um, they gave me a book called Baha'u'llah and the New Era, and that was the first Baha'i book I actually took <laughs> and brought home, and I could not stop reading it. I mm. stayed up all night, and every page I turned, I said, oh, my God, I've been a Baha'i all my life. I just didn't know. Oh, this is what I believe. So it was all there. All mm. the answers were there. And, um, but... But, <laughs> remember, I was on the FBI blacklist. I was already engaged in another whole life. And this very nice, beautiful religion didn't deserve to have somebody like me in it. That's what I figured. Mm. It would bring too many complications. So I just, once in a while, I would go to their fireside meetings. And um, one evening, I brought a friend with me. Actually, he's the one who said... Let's go. And so we went together. And he asked, how does one become a Baha'i? And this family got very excited, and they brought these cards, and they said, you know, administratively you sign these cards, but it's really a statement of your belief in Baha'u'llah. And uh, they brought two cards and two pens. You know, mine's sitting there on the coffee table, and I said, well, said to him, well, why don't you go ahead? And he said, No. I don't know hardly anything about the Baha'i faith. You're the one who's going to go ahead. <laughs> he said, you've been telling everybody about this faith. I know you accept it. I don't know why you won't sign the card. I said, but that's my business. And so they went in the kitchen <laughs> while we <laughs> argued. <laughs> and uh, they, you know, it got quiet, so they came in, and they brought tea and cookies and things. And so we were sitting there. And he said, I, you know, I don't mean to be pushy, but he said, everything you say shows that you believe in this faith. And if you don't accept, you don't accept it formally, you can't participate fully. So I don't understand why you don't do this. What have you got to lose? So I signed a card. <laughs> it was true. I really did believe. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. I was worried. So I thought, well, I can publicly announce my belief and accept the Baha'i faith, and then just make a transition time, you know, until I could really fully be active. Mm -hmm. So I was very excited because he mm. was right. <laughs> I really was a Baha'i. Mm. That was in February of 1969. Mm. And when I went to the next, they invited me to another Baha'i meeting that was called the 19-Day Feast. And, and what's that? The 19-Day Feast mm -hmm. is... Uh, it's every 19 days, um, Baha'is have their uh, spiritual celebration. You can't say it's not like going to church on Sunday, but in a way it's a time when the community comes together, and it involves prayer and devotions. And the difference between most other religions is that it also involves administration of the faith with the whole community present and a very active social time. Um, it could be sharing food. It could be not sharing food, but socializing and getting to know each other better. Mm -hmm. And there's usually music. And so when I went to the 19-day feast, I was told, you're the ninth member of the Baha'i community. And I thought, well, so? <laughs> what does that mean? I just wasn't quite sure, you know. I hadn't read a whole lot more than Baha'u'llah in the New Era, mm -hmm. which is more historical. And so they said, well, that means that we can form our local spiritual assembly of the Baha'is in Memphis. And I said, oh, okay. And it's the first local spiritual assembly of the Baha'is in Memphis. Oh, my gosh. Okay. So we'll have a meeting because, you know, there's only nine of us, so we can declare jointly that we are the local spirit. I said, okay. So then they set a date. We went, all got, nine of us were there. And we signed these papers saying, so that we could be registered as an institution. And then we elected officers. <laughs> and I was elected secretary. I mean, I'm a secretary at Memphis, but I wasn't trained as a secretary. I only did that because of the civil rights movement. But somehow the friends there, the Baha'i friends, thought I was a secretary. <laughs> well, the first year 
of the local spiritual assembly of Memphis, Tennessee, there are no minutes, no records. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know what to do, and they didn't know what to tell me. We were pretty oh, new. Oh, that's funny. But we met, and uh, we discussed the situation in the city and also our spiritual growth as a community. And we decided that it was despicable that no inter- people couldn't marry interracially. So if a white person wanted to marry black or a black or white, you couldn't, not in Tennessee. And being from Massachusetts, I was like totally blown away. And I said, well, couldn't this assembly do something about that? They thought, well, we don't know, maybe. you know. So the assembly decided to invite our state senator to meet with us, and he came. And we did our homework, though. We presented the legal documents for Massachusetts of the law of marriage, which included marriage between two people, no ifs, ands, or buts about race or anything like that. And he took the documentation with him and went to the Congress, to the Senate, State Senate, and within a short while, the law was changed. No way. Yeah. Wow. So that was, I'm sure there were other people asking, but thank God we were able to, you know, support that. And so the one of the first, not probably not the first, but one of the first marriages, interracial marriages to take place was between the son of this couple and his wife, who was black. Mm. He was white and she was black. And they were, they were going to have to get married in Arkansas, but they got married in uh, Tennessee. Mm. What a great story. So, yeah. Then I moved back up to Massachusetts after that. Now, why did you leave Memphis? A lot we- of sadness. I think, you know... I was on the street uh, during the Garbage Workers March, and um, we were all the first row all along the parade line. And I heard Martin Luther King say to Ralph Abernathy, Ralph Abernathy was on his right, and uh, Jesse Jackson was young then, but he was on his other side. And um, Dr. King turned to Ralph Abernathy and said, Ralph, if anything happens to me, you just keep going. It's so important that we finish this march. It doesn't matter what happens to me. And there were gunshots during that, right after that, during that march. And so we didn't know what happened because the police, I mean, we had to disperse. And uh, it was after that, though, you know, in the motel that he was assassinated. And that was very discouraging. And at the same time, you know, the Panthers would disband. Everything was just, you know seemed like it was falling apart. Yeah, and the South was tough. The South was really resisting. I mean, even the laws were being put in place, and I just needed to come home. I needed to come back to my home, to my roots, and recuperate and kind of pull myself together. And so I did. I Mm. came back, (laughs) back to Springfield. Yeah. So what did you do when you got back to Springfield? I went back to college. Mm -hmm. I reconnected with friends that... uh, that I knew when I first got involved in the civil rights movement. Mm. Actually, the first week I was back, I took my mother grocery shopping in the black neighborhood. And she's like, I've never been to this stop and shop before. (laughs) I'm like, well, I have. I've shopped here a lot, Mom. It's fine. And uh, okay, fine. So we go there. And as we're coming out in the parking lot, I saw a friend of mine, a woman, and I said, Christine. And she said, oh, my God, Francis, where have you been? And so we embraced. And I told her that I had been living in Memphis and, you know, that I had accepted this wonderful religion. And I, w- I wanted to tell her about it. And she said, well, what's the name of the religion? And I said, the Baha'i Faith. And she said, so have I. No way. <laughs> yeah. Oh she had God. accepted Christine Williams. She had accepted the Baha'i Faith while I was gone, too. And we were hugging and crying. And my mother's like, what's going on? (laughs) And so she invited me to a gathering at the home of another friend in that same neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And I went, and it was very dark. And I thought, oh, my goodness, it's so dark. Maybe I have the wrong place, you know, because it was in an apartment building and up on the fourth floor. But I rang the bell. And a guy came to the door, and he said, uh, yeah, what do you want? And I said, I'm looking for a Baha'i meeting. I don't, oh, yeah, this is the place. I said, are you sure? He said, yeah, come on in, come on in. But it was dark. The hallway was dark. And I thought, 
oh, maybe it's, you know, who knows? I don't know. So I went in. <laughs> but, oh, well. All right, I'll go in. So I went in. He shut the door, and he said, come on, the living room's down this hallway. So I w- follow him down this dark hallway, and suddenly all the lights go on, and it's surprise. <laughs> oh. At least six folks who were involved in the Panthers and the Civil Rights Movement, along with other Baha'i friends. But they had all become Baha'is. There were at least six of us. Oh, my god! Yeah, it was so exciting. It was so exciting. Wow. Very exciting times. Mm. Mm-hmm. And so um, one person I reconnected with had become a professor at American International College, and I went to visit him, and he said, you need to go back to college. You have no degree, you know. How, is, how, long, is it, how long had it been since you graduated from high school? Five years. And I said, oh, I don't know if I can be settled down enough, you know. I certainly would love to have a degree, and I, I'd be excited about learning more. And so he said, well, take a few evening courses or something. So I took one course, and I got excited. So I applied, and um, I got accepted, and I qualified for financial aid. And uh, after my first semester, I got a full scholarship for the rest of my studies. Mm and finished my studies at AIC and got very excited about Africa because Mm. AIC was the only college in this area, public or private, to offer African studies at that time. Professor Lee Holt, he was an English professor from Amherst. He and his wife lived in Amherst and very beautiful man. Mm. He decided to offer this course in African studies. And I took it, and it was fantastic. And I thought, I love the African spirit. Someday I have to go to Africa. Mm. So I applied to graduate school and was accepted. Now, what did you get your bachelor's degree in? Um, Sociology and anthropology. Mm -hmm. And got accepted with a teaching assistantship at uh, University of South Carolina in Columbia. But just before that, I had a terrible car accident and had to have surgery. Mm. And the neurosurgeon said, you aren't traveling. You're not going anywhere. Uh. And so anyway, he was amazed at how fast I healed. He's like, you shouldn't be. He says, you're not taking any painkillers. I said, no, I don't have any pain. So I shared with him the Baha'i healing prayers that I was Mm. saying. Mm. And uh, off I went. That I had surgery um, Memorial Day weekend, emergency surgery, and I was in Columbia, South Carolina, at the end of August. Wow. <laughs> well, so then I started graduate school. Mm-hmm. But I met a man who had been living in Africa, and we fell in love. And he was willing to wait till I finished my master's degree, and then we could go to Africa. But I was not happy with the program mm. because I thought I was going to be doing African studies. My major professor was an Africanist. She had just come back from Kampala, Uganda. But the rest of the department had no interest in Africa. And the <laughs> one of the top professors wanted me to come to Lunenburg, Massachusetts to study the chicken farmers. <laughs> said, no, thank you. I'm not going to do that. So... This wonderful man and I fell in love, and we got married. And I told him, I said, I'd rather go to Africa than finish this degree Mm. at this time in my life. Mm -hmm. So we went. And where'd you go? (laughs) We started out in what was then called Dahomey. Dahomey is right next to Nigeria. Okay. It's now called uh, Benin, Republic Populaire du Benin. And it's between Togo and Nigeria call the two string beans the two string beans um, Benin and Togo the capital of Benin is Cotonou and the capital of Togo is Lomi Mm -hmm. so we landed in Cotonou and uh, had to work because we certainly weren't independently wealthy and we weren't going to live off the Africans Mm -hmm. and so we uh, went up country and there was a textile factory there and they hired my husband my then husband and um, he was an electronics engineer in the textile factory. And then there was a revolution. <laughs> oh, my God. The country went socialist. And so we were the only Americans 
in this big village where the factory was. It was mainly French and African. And uh, they would come marching back and forth in front of our house. Abales American, down with the Americans. And they did sort of this Hitler kind of thing, this Ooh. socialist, communist thing, you know. And it just... Mm. I was becoming ill because of the climate, too. The climate was difficult there. Mm. It was um, very, very hot and very dry. So we... Now, did you run into any Baha'is there? Um, there were no Baha'is there. I we see. were it. Mm-hmm. And the first uh, year we were there, the actually first few months... Um, it was Baha'i New Year's, which we call Nauru's. It's in March at the uh, Vernal Equinox, March 21st. And so there we were, just the two of us, and I was just learning French. I really didn't know much French. And so I said, why don't we just decorate our house and have a wonderful party and, you know, maybe invite some neighbors for music and things and just celebrate. And so we did. We decorated our house and people came over and people played drums and we danced and about two weeks later this man came to visit visit us one evening and he said I don't know if I have the right house he was, an, he was a local person um, Beninois they called him and he was very shy about coming to this white family and you know he didn't know us at all so we said, no, come in, come in and have have a cup of coffee with us. And he said, he said, I heard about your party, and my friend said that you were celebrating New Year's in March. He said, the only people who do that are Baha'is that I ever knew of. And we said, yes. And he was a Baha'i from Niger, from another country nearby, who had gotten a job at this factory. So there were three of us. <laughs> <laughs> so if we hadn't had that New Year's celebration, we might not have met him. Oh, wow. Marcelin was his name. Mm. And so the three of us would meet and pray and, and have gatherings. And he would bring friends. And little by little, I was able to speak some French and meet some people. And um, we had to leave within a year and a half, mainly because of my health and the, and also the situation. But when we left, there was a local spiritual assembly of Paraku. It was Paraku in the north. And very strong, wonderful Baha'i people. So mm. mm-hmm. we came back to the United States for a short while. Uh, we lived in Louisiana so that we would maintain our French. We lived in uh, uh. Raleigh, Louisiana, the rice capital of the world. No, Raleigh was the frog capital. But we lived in Crowley. Crowley was the rice capital. And my husband worked on the oil wells, electronic systems. And I worked for the uh, soybean farmer's market kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Um, And then within like nine months, uh, we met someone who was vacationing back in the States, visiting their family, who was living in the Ivory Coast, and said that it would be wonderful if we could move to the Ivory Coast. So we did. (laughs) So how long were you in Louisiana? About a year. Okay. About a year. Mm-hmm. And so then we arrived in the Ivory Coast in 1977 and stayed there until 1990. And we lived in Boisquet, which is now sort of the line of demarcation for the Civil War, mm-hmm. unfortunately. But mm-hmm. yeah. yeah. You were in the Ivory Coast for 77 until 1990, you said? That's 13 years? Mm-hmm. Yeah, moved to Boaké. There was a Baha'i center there, so we had a place to live. And I found a job teaching English at a small school. And then my husband was doing odd jobs at this text, a big textile factory. And they finally hired him full-time. And uh, I continued to teach English, and he mm. got laid off within two years. Mm. But we were very blessed while we mm-hmm. were there. We were mm-hmm. able to adopt five wonderful children. Oh, wow. And um, one of my children lives nearby. Mm-hmm. Her name is Violette. Mm-hmm. We yeah. were very blessed. We mm-hmm. had a wonderful life. And I miss the people there. Very beautiful, beautiful souls and beautiful mm-hmm. people. Mm-hmm. And then when you left the Ivory Coast, where did you come back to? Came back home to my mom and dad for a <laughs> while just mm-hmm. to recuperate. But yeah. We moved to North Carolina and because there was some textile work mm-hmm. there, and uh, we figured that might be a place to start actually 
My husband had a contract offer, but it fell through when we got mm. there. So we were living in Raleigh, North Carolina for a few years. Well, let me backtrack. Why did, why did you leave after 13 years? There was a civil war. And the textile factories all over West Africa were closing. The schools were closing. The school where I had worked would would only hire Africans, and even then they had to close the school. So our own children couldn't even go to school. Mm. Um, there was no means of income. You don't know where to work. Mm. Um, we thought about staying in Abidjan for a while because people were working in Abidjan, mm. but we just weren't, we're not big city people, you know. And living yeah. in a big city was just not possible, you know. That's why I'm in Amherst. <laughs> um, so we had yeah. to leave. It was very difficult, but mm. we thought, well, we can prepare to come back. You know, one of these days we would come back. But um, anyway, we weren't yeah. able to do that, and I'm now back in Massachusetts. So. Mm-hmm. So what are you doing these days? I work at the University of Massachusetts in the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering. And the best part of it is that I work with international students, mainly international graduate students. I'm the academic programs manager, so I manage all of the student affairs. And um, we have a wonderful, diverse faculty also. So I love that. I'm still have the world map up, you know, and people put pins when they arrive, you know, and we've got the whole Middle Earth covered. (laughs) It's like everyone says, whoa. So I'm still Mm -hmm. enjoying that diversity. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, The Baha'i community in this area is wonderful, and uh, I enjoy the diversity involved with facilitating discussion groups and study circles and participating in various Baha'i events. Mm. I think that people are in a quieter mode, but there is a movement towards change. I think nowadays I'm sensing people are getting a little tired of the day-to-day quest, if you wish, after money and material Mm. things. Mm -hmm. It's starting to mean less because people are getting less of it. The average person is not doing very well financially. And so, therefore, it's like, well, what do I do now? What's the meaning to all this? And also having so many of our young men dying, in, young men and women dying in Iraq mm-hmm. has had an effect on people. Mm-hmm. So I'm very hopeful that there will be some sparks of spirituality and spiritual growth. And I think that this area could definitely benefit from that. Mm. Well, thank you very much, Francis, and I, uh, the best of luck to you. Thank you very much, Warren. I hope you enjoyed that interview with Francis Cognati, a Baha'i from Western Massachusetts who was very involved in the civil rights movement in the 60s. For a copy of this and other interviews, you're welcome to go to the website www.abahaiperspective.com. For information specifically on the Baha'i faith, you can go to the website www.baha'i.org or you can call the toll-free number 1-800-22-UNITE. I hope you'll join me next time on A Baha'i Perspective.